بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته After the death of Mother Khadija May Allah be pleased with her the Prophet alayhi salatu was was in mourning. He was sad. And he had so many things on his plate. The companions noticed that. They noticed that he had girls in his home to take care of with no woman in the house. He had so many obligations regarding his followers, Quran that is revealed to him, idol worshippers that he is obliged to give da'wah and to call them to Islam, how to protect those who followed him and believed in him. So many things were occupying his mind with a touch of grief and sadness that no one can miss. Only then a suggestion for him to get married was proposed to the Prophet ﷺ by Khawla bint Hakim. And see, she was the wife of Uthman ibn Mad'un, one of his close companions. So she, she suggested, O Prophet of Allah, why don't you get married? So the Prophet said to her, alayhi salatu wasalam, who, who should I get married to? What are the proposals that you have for me? She said, a virgin or someone who's not a virgin? You pick. So he asked her, who was the virgin? She said, the daughter of your beloved companion, the most beloved person on earth, your heart, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, his daughter Aisha. Then the Prophet said, والسلام, who is the non-virgin? And she said, Sauda bint Zam'a. And the Prophet والسلام, praised her and complimented her when he heard her name. So the Prophet said to her, go and check them out. Ask whether there is acceptance or not. Khawla went to Abu Bakr's house, and this is something that we will talk about tomorrow, inshallah. And then she went to Sauda's house. She met Mother Sauda, and she asked her, or actually she gave her the glad tidings, what blessings and goodness from Allah had come your way? So she said, what is that? And she said to her, the Prophet ﷺ had sent me to ask for your hand. Sauda was overwhelmed with joy. This is something that had never ever crossed her mind, not in her wildest dreams. And she said to her, I wish, meaning that I'm more than happy to accept and I wish that this can materialize, but I, I'm, I'm still not believing it. Please go and speak to my father. And Sauda's father was not a Muslim. And her brother was not a Muslim as well, and he was a staunch enemy of Islam. But at the time, he was at Hajj. So Khawla went to meet this old, frail man. And she said to him, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, had sent me 
to ask for Sauda's hand. This non-Muslim, although all the idol worshippers were at war and were at with a lot of enmity and hatred to the Prophet and to the religion that he had brought to them, when he heard his name, he said, he's an honorable, worthy man. This is the first thing that came into his mind. And he said it. And he asked Khawla, you proposed to me now. What about your friend, Sauda? Does she accept him as a suitor to her? She said she loves that. So the father said, call her to me. Sauda came. He addressed his daughter. Muhammad has sent a proposal to you. And he's an honorable, worthy person. Would you like me to marry you to him? She said, yes, father. So he said to her, to Khawla, call him. And he came and he got her married to him. So who is this Sauda? May Allah be pleased with her. And what is her story? You see, when a person is used to traveling first class and in staying in five or seven stars hotels, it would be difficult for him to go a little bit below his standard. And we know the standard of Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. So why did the Prophet ﷺ marry after her this Sauda? And who is she? What does she have? Well, Sauda's name is Sauda bint Zam'a ibn Qais al-Amiriyya al-Qurashiyya. And her mother's name was Ash-Shumus bint Qais. She's the first woman the Prophet married after the death of his late wife Khadija bint Khuwaylid. May Allah be pleased with her. And the Prophet remained with Sauda for three years. He was married to her alone for three years. She had no other co-wives. So what is the story of Sauda? Sauda was among the first to accept Islam, among the companions in Mecca. She and her husband, who was her cousin, his name was As-Sakran ibn Amr. They both accepted Islam, suffered greatly on the hands of the idol worshippers in Mecca because they did not have that much power or influence and they did not have the backing of a strong tribe to defend them. You see, when Muslims accepted Islam in Mecca, each person had one of the dignitaries of Mecca to protect him. Though that dignitary himself used to torture other Muslims and used to express enmity against Islam. But due to a reason or the other, that individual that went into his protection was safe from others. Sauda and her husband did not have that protection. So they fled Mecca and they migrated to Abyssinia. They crossed the Red Sea in boats. Only Allah knows what kind of boats were they. And they lived there under the protection of an Najashi who gave them safe haven. 
and allowed them to worship Allah as they wished. They fled with their iman, with their religion. They fled prosecution. All what they wanted was to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. That's it, nothing else. Let us worship our God. And this is what Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Buruj. وَمَا نَقَمُوا مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا أَن يُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ The enemies of Islam, the only thing that they do not like is that we worship Allah alone. If Muslims were to worship other than Allah, the non-Muslims would be okay with that. They would not prosecute them. They would not fight them. They would not kill them. The main reason for their attacks, their hatred, their enmity, their will to annihilate Muslims is because Muslims worship Allah alone. And they submit their will to Allah alone. No hidden agendas. Muslims are like an open book. You can tell exactly what they think, what they're thinking about. So they stayed in Abyssinia, worshiping Allah, though their hearts were still connected to Mecca, to the Kaaba, to their homeland. And to their surprise, rumors spread like wildfires. It spread like wildfire in Abyssinia among the Muslims that all the idol worshippers have accepted Islam. They were so happy. They were so joyful because now they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. They realized that this is the time for them to go back to their homeland. Only to discover after a treacherous journey across the raging sea in boats that only Allah knows what it was made of. When they reached Jeddah and then moved on foot to Mecca in a journey that took them four or five days, when they reached there exhausted and tired, they were faced by the brutal reality that what they had heard about the idol worshippers accepting Islam was fake news. It was a lie. So each one of the migrants looked for one of the dignitaries to enter in his protection, and they managed to do so, except as Sakran and his wife, Sauda. They had no one. And after that long journey, as Sakran, who was in his late 50s, maybe early 60s, fell ill and died, leaving a widow who was Muslim among her family who were idol worshippers. She had no one to turn to. She had no one to seek his protection. So you can imagine the grief and sorrow she was in after all what she had suffered throughout the years. And for what? For just simply worshipping Allah the Almighty. Here was the breakthrough. He was the salvation. When the Prophet والسلام, proposed to her, she accepted in a heartbeat. She would not think twice. Who would think twice? What we can learn from this 
is that the Prophet والسلام, marriages were not based on his desire of women. Though that would have been totally acceptable and normal. No one in his right mind would condemn a man for liking women. This is human nature. Men like women. And this is why they get married. And this is what Allah mentioned in the Quran, that it was beautified in men's hearts, the love of women, of children, of gold and silver. All of these things were made beautiful to us by Allah Azza wa Jal. But what you should notice and pay attention to that the Prophet ﷺ was not as they accused him of being a womanizer. When he was 25 years of age, in the prime of his youth and strength, he married a woman 15 years older than him and stayed law uh, lawful and loyal for 25 more years not having a second wife, not having a con concubine, nothing. Totally devoted for her love. When she died, he could have chosen anyone from the Muslim companions around him. Anyone would have been honored to give him his daughter or his sister. He could have chosen Miss Universe, if he was looking for lust and desire. He remained unmarried for a while. And when they, the companions proposed to him that he gets married, he married a woman in her early 50s. A woman described in the books of history as being huge and big in size, that anyone could identify her, though she, though she is covered from head to toe, but she can be identified by her size. In an authentic hadith, Umar used to tell the Prophet ﷺ, why don't you cover your women and not let them go out? And one day, Sauda went out of the Prophet's house, ﷺ, fully covered, and Umar saw her and say, said to her, O oh, Sauda, we recognize you, we know that you're Sauda. So she went back immediately and complained to the Prophet ﷺ of what Umar had said. And then Allah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ that it is permissible, it's okay for them to leave their homes for necessities like at the time, answering the call of nature, which was done outside the city for everyone. They didn't have any toilets in their homes at the time. So she was a, book, a big woman in size. And no one had ever said that she was beautiful or glamorous or wealthy or that she had anything special in her that would attract men. And we don't say this, may Allah forbid, to discredit her or to look down upon her. She's our mother. No one disrespects his mother. But it's just for you to contemplate. Is the Prophet Muhammad a womanizer? He chose a woman only for her religious commitment. She's a widow, she's alone, and she needed someone to protect her. The Prophet took it upon himself to be that someone. He married her. He opened her house for her. 
she stayed with him for three years and the prophet did not go and look for any other woman, though he could have. But he didn't. And this is a practical lesson that the prophet is giving us, alayhi salatu wasalam, giving men, that when you get married, it's not the beauty that counts. It's not the wealth. It's the chemistry that you find with this woman who if she is Allah fearing, she would make your house a paradise. Three years the Prophet lived with her, never ever alayhi salatu wasalam complained about her or said anything negative about her or the books of history reported a fight between them. She was a good, righteous, pious woman, and the Prophet ﷺ loved her. She was also a witty, smart woman. After the Prophet ﷺ married different wives for many different reasons, as we will come and discuss this, inshallah, she felt that she was too old for the Prophet ﷺ to give him his marital rights. So she took the initiative and said to the Prophet ﷺ, O Prophet of Allah, I love what you love. And all what I care about is your comfort and peace of mind. And because you love Aisha more than your other wives, I grant and give willingly and happily my night to Aisha. So every night you go to your wives. When it's my night, don't come to me, go to Aisha. And when it's Aisha's night, you go to Aisha. So you spend two nights with her rather than one night with her and one night with me. The Prophet والسلام, appreciated that for her. Mother Aisha herself, she said, there is no woman on earth I would like to be in her shoes. I wish I can be like her, except Sauda bint Zama. She is one heck of a woman. When she got old, she gave her night to the Prophet ﷺ as a gift, and she gave that night from herself to me. So the Prophet used to give me, Aisha, two nights, and all the rest of his wives one night each. She was a wise woman. She did not have what we call possessive love. Nowadays, women want to own their husbands. He should not leave the house without telling me where he's going. I would occupy his mobile phone with missed calls until he answers, where are you? What time are you coming back? Why don't you tell me? And if he were to think of getting married again, she would turn his life into a living hell. This is possessive love. This is not realistic. No one says, woman, go and search for a, another wife for your husband. No one says this. But if it were inevitable, if he is in need to, getting, to get married, a woman has to be as smart as Sauda, weighs the pros and cons and knows when to take a step back and let the ball rolling. The Prophet والسلام, said to the wives of the Prophet when they gathered once and they asked the Prophet والسلام, O Prophet of Allah, which one of us wives will be the first to die after you, to catch up with you after death. Which one is the first to die? So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu the longest, the one with the longest 
hand or longest arm. So they brought a measuring tool and they started measuring their arms to know which one of them was the longest arm. And they found that Zainab bin Jahsh was the one with the longest arm. After the death of the Prophet والسلام, it was Sauda that died first. Only then they understood the meaning of the longest hand or the longest arm, which means the most of you who gives charity the most. And the most generous of them all was Sauda, may Allah be pleased with her, the mother of the poor and the needy. She used to give all what she had to the poor. Umar once sent her money and she looked at it and she said, what is this? It's like dates. So many of them. And within minutes, she distributed the whole sack of gold and silver to the poor and the needy and she left nothing for herself. This was Sauda bint Zam'a, the mother of the believers, a woman that had nothing to attract men, that is, normal men, to get married to her. Yet she drew the attention of the Prophet ﷺ with her iman, with her religious commitment. And this is what qualified her to be the mother of the believers, your mother and mine. May Allah Azza wa Jal be pleased with her. She died at the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. And some say that she died uh, at the year of 54 Hijrah. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatul ilmi ilayhi aslam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyina Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم reminded us through his guidance and example, that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah. For one who submits a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success, but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test. Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, becomes an example for his companions to follow. Similarly, he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah, or lives according to what his desires dictate. Whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart or is it merely on the surface? He will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity as he does when in comfort, whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life. Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith Trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah. For him tests will be conducted on earth while he lives, and not after he dies. He knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world, his tests are over. There, he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed 
during a short span of time called life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um Aisha says, can a woman correct from behind if the Imam makes mistake in recitation of the Quran during Salah? What if there are only women praying behind their mahram Imam? In this condition, can one of them correct him? The general rule is that the Prophet ﷺ once was leading the congregational prayer and one of the companions spoke out of ignorance. He did not know that speaking is not allowed. And he started saying things. So the companions started clapping on their thighs. After the prayer was over, the Prophet corrected the situation, taught the man who needed teaching, and then addressed the companions that if anything happens in the Salat, you should say, Subhanallah to draw attention for clapping is for women. So if a woman during the Salat notices that the Imam did not sit for the first tashahad and stood up, she claps to bring the, his attention that you made a mistake. Why? Because she's not allowed to talk during Salat. Now, this differs when women or a woman pray with a group of mahrams or one mahram. So in this case, if you are praying in the house with your mahrams, your father, your uh, uh, brothers, and maybe your sons, all of them are their, your mahram. None of them is a non-mahram. If the imam makes a mistake, there's no problem, none whatsoever for a woman to speak out and correct the mistake of the imam. And if he makes a mistake in movement, she can say, subhanallah, not clap. Because the reason for not speaking is that non mahram may be affected by her voice, how soft it is. And shaitan could come and mess up with their minds during salat. But mahrams, brothers, fathers, uncles, sons, they all know her voice and they know her. There's no problem in her to speak. But if there is a single man with them who's an non mahram, this is a no go. Suhail says, if Allah has decreed everything and written down how we will spend our lives and where we will end, whether hell or paradise, then what is our role in all this? And why should we work hard when our destiny has already been preordained? Pre so, Hail, this question is problematic. Because one of the six articles of Iman, actually the last one of them, is known as وَأَن تُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ To believe in predestiny, whether good or bad. So, to believe in predestiny, you have four things that you must believe in. First, Allah's knowledge of what was in the past, in the present, and the future, and what did not happen, how would it be if it were to happen? Two, Allah's writing of such destiny. Three, Allah's creation of such things that will happen. And four, Allah's divine will. So you have to believe in all of that in order for you to believe in predestiny. So when you say, then why should we work hard when our destiny has already been preordained? Question number one, do you believe Allah is knowledgeable? Answer is yes, alhamdulillah. 
Do you believe that Allah is fair and just? The answer is yes. Alhamdulillah. Do you believe that Allah Azza wa Jal owns everything in this universe? The answer is yes. In this case, you should act and behave to the best of your ability because you do not know what Allah has preordained for you. Because if you believe in destiny, then you should know that everything is written down, but you don't know whether I'm going to do a sin or I'm going to pray to rak'ahs. You choose. And the choice of yours is already preordained. You have a choice. You say, but Allah preordained upon me to do this. I say, go to the highest building in your town. 20, 30, 40 stories high. Look down, it's a long way. Now you jump. If Allah preordained that you'll f fall on your feet safe, unharmed, and walk away, it will happen. But if not, you will die. Will you do that? He said, no, of course not. Am I crazy? Why not? He said, because I know that I'm going to die. Likewise, if you sin, you're going to go to hell. Will you sin? Mm, no, I, I don't think I have to sin. I, I shouldn't sin. Okay, why, why do you cook food? So that I can eat. If I don't eat, I'm going to die of hunger. Why don't you say it's already preordained? I'm just going to sit and watch. If Allah wants to fill up my stomach, Allah would do that. So you have to acknowledge these things in order not to allow shaitan to play and manipulate your mind. Uh, we have Muhammad from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam. I apologize for taking so much time off the phone. Yes, Sakhi. Uh, okay. Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad from Algeria. Yes, sir. Uh, Sheikh, I, uh, I am Imam uh, in Sweden, a yani new Imam. Masha. But I can't speak uh, good English. Can I uh, speak, uh, can, can I uh, ask the question in Arabic, please, Sheikh? Yes, go ahead, but make it short because I have to translate it for the viewers. Okay. يا شيخ في في السويد الإخوة كما تع نعم يا شيخ الإخوة في السويد عندهم إشكال في قضية المواقيت والله إشكال كبير قضية صلاة صلاة الفجر والعشاء وكذلك مواقيت بالنسبة للرؤية والحساب في شهر رمضان ما هي الطريق طريقة الأمثل يا شيخ وكيف نستطيع أن نتواصل مع سماحتكم من أجل هذه القضية يا شيخ والله متعب كثيرا أبشر غير ذلك فقط شيخنا الحبيب أوكي بارك الله فيكم So brother Muhammad he said he's from Nigeria but now he's asking about an issue of Sweden So maybe Nigeria is a town in Sweden I haven't been there so yet um, So he's asking about a common problem worldwide and this problem is always found in uh, UK when Fajr is actually due. Some, th sometimes you find an hour and a half difference between opinions. This can't be this much, an hour and a half. Yeah, I need five minutes, 10 minutes. I, I can tolerate this, but when you say an hour or an hour and a half, so in Sweden, especially when there is problem with the shortness of the night when they have like four hours five ten minutes more would add a lot of value to them so they're having problem with the moon sighting as well Akhi Muhammad this isn't something that can be answered in a very direct and precise manner because the moon sighting depends on the Islamic authority in Sweden. So if you have an Islamic center that the majority, not all, because definitely you will not have all the Muslims uh, uh, collaborating with it, but the majority of Muslims consider that Islamic center or that Islamic Sharia board to give them the rules on divorce, marriage, inheritance, fatwas, to rule cases between Muslims, so they consider it to be an Islamic authority, they give the timings of Ramadan and Eid. 
and you have to follow that. Whether they do this through calculation, which is wrong, or they do this through sighting of the moon, which might not be very accurate or possible, or they do it through following Saudi Arabia, which a lot of the Islamic centers are doing nowadays, especially in the UK, because it's always difficult to sight the moon, always clouds raining, etc. So they thought it is safer to be with Saudi Arabia all the time, and a lot of scholars have permitted that. So this is for moon sighting. As for Fajr prayer and Isha prayer and Maghrib prayer, etc., sunset we have no problem in. Everybody knows when sunset is. But even though if it is not possible, the scholars have to improvise and come up with a calculation, a method of calculation. The most reliable method of calculation that I know of is Umm al-Qura. When you have an app, it tells you, would you like it to be collaborated or, or uh, to be synchronized with Karachi University or with ISNA or with uh, the Muslim League or with Umm al-Qura? Choose Umm al-Qura. This is the best for Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib. Timings. Isha, it's not accurate because they always have it as at one and a half hours after sunset, throughout the whole year, 11 months. And in Ramadan, they make it two hours, which is totally wrong. So what to do when it comes to Isha? You can use the University of Karachi or any other one, because usually it is almost accurate. Why do we say that Umm al-Qura calculation is accurate? Because this is what the great scholars such as Sheikh Saleh al-Fuzan has stated. Here in Saudi, it was said that the Fajr time is not accurate. And so many people came and said, no, this is too early. You have to wait another 15 minutes to pray or 17 minutes. And Shuyukh came and said this and that. So they confused the people. I heard this from Sheikh Muhammad bin Saleh al-Munajjid himself. When I asked him this question, he said, I asked Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan myself. So this is a connected chain of narrators. And Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan said, my son, I went to a place outside the outskirts of Riyadh. And I spent the whole night facing the east, anticipating and waiting for the honest or the true uh, dawn to break. And once I noticed it, it was horizontal, it coincided exactly with Umm al-Qura timetable. So depend on this, and inshallah, you will uh, be successful. Abdu from the, from the US. OK, we think, I think we lost Abdu. Uh, OK, Kishwar says, if the husband tells his wife not to go out or not to do something. And if you did it, you would be divorced. Will she actually be divorced if she did it? And what should the man do if uh, he wants to uplift that condition? This statement is known to the scholars as conditional divorce. And what do we mean by conditional divorce? It means that you make it as a condition. If you do this, you're divorced. If you raise the cup, you're divorced. If you open the door, you're divorced. If you don't cook food by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you're divorced. Now, real men don't say this. Only people with little intellect who are unable to control their wives or at least to communicate with them, they would use this format in this condition. And it's a long issue of dispute among scholars. The most authentic opinion is it depends on your intention, the man's intention. So the woman doesn't know what's his intention. A man says, 
if you go to your sister's house, you're divorced. And the woman goes to her sister's house. And she comes back. The man calls, Sheikh, I said so and so and so. What to do? Should I kick her out of the house? Not my wife anymore? Or what? Is there an expiation? The question is directed to the husband. When you said that statement, did you intend to divorce her? If the man says, by Allah, I did not intend to divorce her. I just wanted to stop her from going there, there because every time she goes to her sister, she comes back and she twists her mind and she nags me and demands more money, etc. So I just wanted to prevent her from going there. I have children. I love my wife. In this case, we say this is not a divorce. This is a conditional oath and it was broken. Go and feed 10 poor people. If the man says, my sister-in-law runs a brothel and only prostitutes go to her house. And I told my wife, if you go there, you're divorced because I don't want to have a wife having any connection with such bad reputation. In this case, the divorce takes place. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Abdu from the U.S. Abdu? Yes. Yes, Akhi. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Yes, yeah, brother. Uh, thank you very much for your all the information you've been given us. I've been watching you from uh, Al Huda from uh, United, and now I'm in Riyadh. I'm watching you here. I'm very Happy to listen to all what you say. Zakallah khair. Mute your television, Abdu. Huh? Mute your television. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, what can I do for you, Akhi? Okay, my question to you is uh, we are praying Tarawah at home now in Riyadh. Uh, yeah, uh, my question to you is uh, I'm praying Tarawah in Riyadh at home. And uh, is it permissible to? Follow the Kaaba Taraweeh prayer from the TV. Okay. Any more question? That's all. Okay. So, Abdu is asking about the ruling on praying behind a TV screen as they pray live in Mecca in the Holy Masjid Al Haram. So, can we pray in congregation? The answer is no. This is not permissible, and if you do pray, your prayer is invalid. First of all, because this is not an actual congregation. This is virtual. They are in a city, and you are in another city. Their sunset is different to your sunset. Their maghrib is different than your maghrib. Not only that, even if you were in Mecca itself, and you were residing in one of them towers adjacent to the Haram, and you can see the Kaaba, and you can see the worshippers doing tawaf, and you can hear the Mu'addin and the Imam leading the prayer, you cannot pray in your room, though you can see everything be, be, uh, uh, below you. Why? Because if anybody calls and says, where are you? You would say, I'm in my room. You wouldn't say, I'm in the masjid. So are you with the congregation? You cannot say, I, I am with the congregation, because you're not. So their prayer in their rooms is not permissible, let alone to pray behind a TV screen, and Allah knows best. Farha says, is it permissible to recite the prescribed duas after sunnah prayer instead of fard prayer? What if we are in a hurry and want to pray sunnah immediately? The Prescribed sunnah is that you recite your dua, your adhkar that is, after the fart. And after you finish your adhkar, you go and pray your sunnah. This is the norm. But if someone has an emergency and he has to leave, there's no problem for him to pray the sunnah in a different location where he prayed the, the fart. It is not permissible to pray your sunnah in the same place you prayed the fard, as we've mentioned this before. Unless you speak 
to someone. And afterwards, you can leave and read your adhkar without a problem, inshallah. Bushra says, can we give food items or basic groceries with our zakat money because of this lockdown? As many people lost their jobs and they do not have money to feed their families. These are two different and separate things. Zakat money must be given in cash to the poor. If you want to give them extra charity by buying them food and, and groceries, may Allah reward you, this is excellent. But if you want to buy with the zakat money food to give it to them, this is not permissible unless they authorize you. Why? Because they know what to do with the money better than you do. So you think that, oh, they are in lockdown, so they need groceries, the poor thing. Maybe they say, no, we want cash. We have to pay for medicine. We have to give somebody his debt that he's been calling us and bugging us for the past six months. Or we have to pay the rent, or we have to pay the electricity bill. So you don't know what they need. They're poor and needy, you give them cash and let them act according to what uh, uh, suits them best. But if you take their authorization and tell them, listen, your zakat money is, is X, Y, Z. It will buy you only this much. But if you authorize me to buy you groceries and food, I can buy wholesale and I can give you this much instead of this much which your money could buy. And they say, yes, please go ahead. Then there's no problem in doing that. Imran says, in some places, the Muslims who are dying of COVID-19, their bodies are not being handed over to their families and they are being cremated. What is the ruling about this in Islam? It is totally prohibited to cremate the bodies of Muslims and non-Muslims alike. This is not permissible. It is part of other faiths, if we can call them faiths, other religions. So this is totally prohibited. But if you are in a totalitarian regime and you have no way to get the body of your brother, of your relative, to give it an Islamic burial, there's nothing you can do. You don't have an army. You cannot fight them because they have all the means of fighting. So this is something that is beyond your capability to handle. And Allah is most forgiving, subhanahu azza wa jal. A sister says, how should a husband and a wife develop love and companionship among each other as divorce rate is on the rise these days? And youngsters have become very intolerant of each other and they don't think divorce is such a big deal because they say this is something halal, so it's better to move on than live miserably. This is a big problem. And I face this problem because I do counseling sessions. And alhamdulillah, we've managed to solve so many marital problems, which most of them are based on eye-opening. The wife thinks that she is not receiving her rights, while the husband thinks that he's not receiving his rights. And both parties only care about their rights, and no one ever asks about their obligations. Not only that, we tend to only see the short uh, um, comings of the other side rather than seeing the good side. So many sisters call and they complain about their husbands and I stop them. And I say, don't mention anything bad about your husband. Tell me what's good in him. And she starts saying, I can't. It's, it's a very long list it would consume the half hour that we have together. So I said, SubhanAllah, all these good things in him can't overwhelm and cover these short Comings of his, these small faults, they're trivial. And they manage to open their eyes and see, oops, subhanAllah, how ungrateful I, wa I was. So 
Couples need tutoring, need to know what their rights, but also what their obligations are. They need to know the seerah of the Prophet and how he used to deal with his wives and how he used to tolerate them. They have to know how important a man should be to his wife and her obligations towards him. And at the same time, a man has to know how to value his wife, how to cherish her and to be good to her because the Prophet said that the best of you is the best to of you to his wives and I'm the best among you to his wives. So these things can't come in a small capsule that you swallow and voila, you become, mashallah, a super uh, uh, hero. It needs knowledge, it needs training, it needs tolerance, it needs to look from different angles to understand what is happening, otherwise life and marriage would not go on. This requires a lot of talk that cannot be covered in answering a Q&A uh, session. This is all the time we have. Tomorrow, inshallah, our program would begin at, um, oh Allah, I don't know, see? Is it one or two? I think it's from, one, from two o'clock, yeah, from two o'clock till, till three o'clock p.m. Mecca time. So from 1400 hours till 1500 hours Mecca time, inshallah, and it will remain till the end of the month at this time in the afternoon. I hope, inshallah, to see you then. And until then, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.